I was sitting on the ice on a perfectly still Antarctic night. I was wearing a down jacket, down pants, big boots, and suddenly an Adeli penguin rocketed out of the water and walked over to me in bare feet. It was one of the most humbling moments of my life. The adaptations of these creatures are stunning. But before I get to the Ross Sea, I want to take you to the Pike Place Fish Market in Seattle, Washington. The young men who work there start their day at 6 a.m. Their teamwork and intense focus immediately revealed one thing. These men are shipmates. Their skill and joy revealed another. They love what they do. And their work is like a dance. There were moments during my two days at the fish market that seemed timeless. What I mean is that I felt connected both to the present moment and in some way to an ancient noble art of the sea. But as the final fish of the day hung suspended in midair, I was supremely sad because I realized that these men, the fish they sell, the men and women that bring those fish to the docks and that noble art itself are all dying. To explain this statement and my sadness, I must back up and take a look at the world's ocean, which I did. I flew from Seattle to San Francisco and drove to Point Reyes National Seashore. I hiked down steep cliffs to a secret beach and sat all day in the rain watching waves crash against the rocks. I found this beach when I was 16. It was the first time I had really seen the ocean and I remember feeling that it was infinite, immutable, absolute. But sitting there on that rainy day, I understood the ocean much differently. There is a map in the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment, a report that combines information from researchers all over the world, which puts the problem into perspective for me. The areas in red represent fisheries that had, quote, reached their maximum potential in 1965. Essentially, these areas had been overfished by the 1960s. This is the same map from 1995. It seems nearly impossible that we could have damaged something as infinite, as immutable, as absolute as the ocean. But the evidence is clear. The ocean is in serious, serious trouble. In fact, there may well be only one large, undamaged open ocean ecosystem left on Earth. And when I found this out, I knew that I had to see the Ross Sea, Antarctica, for myself. The Ross Sea is a five-day trip from New Zealand across the Southern Ocean. Towering waves stretched to the edge of my imagination, and the 400-foot-long ship was thrown around like a toy. On the extremes of the worst rolls, I could walk on the walls. But out of the cauldron of waves and wind, the great birds of the Southern Ocean rode the fierce gusts with nonchalant precision. And then, days further south, a thin white band suddenly stretched across the entire southern horizon, splitting the sea and sky. Finally, I could see the edge of the ice. I had no words. But this desert of ice was only a backdrop for what I had really come to see. For three years, I had been reading about the creatures that live in this extreme place. Nothing, however, could have prepared me for the flood of emotion when I saw them for the first time.
The Ross Sea is, in a word, a triumph. But the Ross Sea story has gotten complicated. In 1996, New Zealand started fishing for Chilean sea bass in the Ross Sea. The Chilean sea bass does not exist. The name was created to market two species of fish with much less appealing names, the Patagonian and Antarctic toothfish. The fishery has grown steadily and now takes over 3,000 tons of fish from the Ross Sea every year. But this number isn't important. What is important is the mounting evidence that toothfish are already disappearing from the Ross Sea and that all members of an ecosystem are tightly tied together. They depend on each other in complex and sometimes counterintuitive ways. It is a grand play of checks and balances. And removing one actor in this play changes the plot entirely because the system itself acts like a single organism. And this gets me to the real point, the reason I had to see the Ross Sea for myself. The Ross Sea story is not just about fish, not just about the incredible organisms that live at the edge of the world. It is a story of interconnected communities. It is our story, the story of our struggle to become sustainable. And we need to take the first step. The guys at the Pike Place Fish Market, Southern Ocean fishermen, and you and I are all bound together. And despite the overwhelming challenges we're about to face, I believe that we can unite our efforts and write the next chapter of this story together. Really, it's our only choice. For the truth is that in the face of exponentially increasing pressure on our world resources, we all comprise a single community, and only in its balance can we find peace. <laughs>